Hello there. And I'd love to tell you how the Tuscans say it, but I don't know. You're listening to Chosen Ones. I'm Goodnight Punk. And I'm joined, as always, by my good friend, Wink. This episode, we'll be going over Mandalorian Chapter 5. Wink, are you ready? That was really bad, Aurora, but um, I'm doing pretty well. I you, can, <laughs> you can't really get sign language across over a podcast, so um, I would just, yeah. Just doing your best Tuscan noises, I, I just, understand. Yeah, I'm trying, I'm okay. trying. <laughs> Dude, so uh, Mandalorian Chapter 5. What is this one called? That's a good question. I want to say it was called The Bounty, but I did not write this down. I cannot remember. I'm going to look it up right now because I literally was thinking about this earlier. It had a name. It absolutely had a name because they all do. It was called The Gunslinger. That's it. Yep, that the makes gunslinger. sense. Yep. The Gunslinger. All right, so... um. We'll just kind of go ahead and go into kind of talking our way through this thing. Um, of course, this thing opened up with a little bit of a ship battle, kind of, which, of course, Mandalorian leaving the last planet that we saw him on, where uh, he ended up running into Jenna Carano's character. And he is flying through space, him and little baby Gizmo, and they're flying and they start getting attacked. And it looked like it looked like a dude in a X Wing wearing X Wing gear, but it didn't it did look, look like, like a normal X Wing. And obviously he wasn't a like Republic or resistance fighter or anything. Yeah, so it looked it like interesting. Republic uh so not only that guy, but the guy we see a little bit later kind of has sort of similar Yeah, attire. For sure. They look very similar, those two bounty hunters in this episode. Yeah, kind, well, two kind of, of the three. Sorry, two of the four. Well, debatable if there's actually four in this episode, but um, <laughs> yeah. so he uses Mando's line: uh, "I can bring you in hot, or I can bring you in cold." And um, so I don't think the Mando liked that. He did not like that at all. So he's like blown up a ship, screws up his engine, but ultimately, I thought he was gonna get. I thought he was gonna totally render that ship useless. At some I did point too. Because that that it, that bounty hunter that was shooting at him had him dead to rights, and then something something space magical happened here. So he was able to throw the thing in reverse. I'm not exactly sure how that works in space, uh, you know, as far as using their thrusters to thrust backwards. I mean, I assume it's probably like any other thing you can kind of turn around. It's opened on both. The engines are both open on both ends. So he kind of shoves this thing in reverse and allows the other ship to just... Not exactly miss him, just skims across him, takes a little bit of damage, and then at that point, he's basically just right in front of Mando, in which... Target lock, got him. Well, not only that, but he reminds him that that's his line. That's my line, buddy. So he's able to uh, take him out and then kind of carry on his way, but not before. He has to shut everything down and then start back up, because he had a fuel leak... And it was kind of interesting. He shut everything down. I was like, "Like, is this ship actually able to fly again? And yet it was. I, I don't know if there's some sort of auto repair mechanic or something like that that this ship has, like rerouting the fuel or something. Um, you know, Seems like he lost, more lost power at that point than, than the fuel was causing the issue. He just kind of turned off the power, went back and flipped a breaker, came back out and started flipping all the switches back on. And the ship came back on. Yeah, so that's like probably he lost a good little power. Moved to his backup power, turned the ship back on, was losing fuel, and the, the basically, all right, well, we got to land at the closest planet. Yeah. I thought it was kind of weird. What was the, the closest was... planet? Oh, Moss Eisley. Of Tatooine. Course. Holy smokes. Woo. We're going back to Tatooine. Yeah, I'm sp- a new hope. Talking about the original planet. I realize Moss Eisley is not a planet. I know. I know you did. I wasn't going to call you out on that. You said most Eisley, which is the spaceport he was going to. Correct. Which is what clued me in to the fact that he was going to Tatooine. Yep. But I'm like, because you hear him talking to the tower and they're like, most Eisley tower, you're cleared for Bay 35. And I'm like, most Eisley? Wait, what? what? We're so going to Tatooine. I felt like this was, this felt like just a nostalgic episode entirely. It didn't feel like there was 
that it was necessarily is, is, there to advance the story all that much. Um, is he flying to the inner planets? Because Tatooine isn't in the Outer Rim, is it? And that's where he's been with the guild, with the Bounty Hunter Guild. So is he escaping the Bounty Hunter Guild by moving to the inner planets? Well, you know and I mean? that that's one thing they talk about whenever he gets there is the, the bar droid kind of mentions that the guild no longer operates on Tatooine. So it is something they've kind of moved away from. And that could be to your point that the New Republic is kind of starting to move around and that that's kind of they've kind of been forced out. That's kind of something that we see is that the, all the kind of dirty work, the, uh, you know, the empire and the bounty hunters have all kind of been dispersed out of Moss Eisley and Tatooine. Uh, you know, cause we see the stormtrooper helmets on the spike and the lack of bounty hunter guild and that sort of stuff. So, uh, the fact yeah, it seems like everyone that's trying to get away from the new Republic has moved to the outer rim. And that's why the bounty hunter guild is probably having its most success out there because anyone that needs a bounty on them based on new Republic or even empire is moving to the outer room, trying to escape things. And probably why they're out there doing all their work and probably why he's moving closer to the inner planets. Yeah. So, so, um, so he lands at Moss Eisley Bay 35 and, he gets out and these repair droids immediately start coming out. He shoots at him, tells the hangar lady, <laughs> whose name is Pelly, um, that you know he doesn't want droids working on a ship. She gets pretty upset that sh- that he shoots at the droids. But this kind of got I, me thinking about something that was kind of interesting. I I've never known what the deal is with all these hangar bays, but it kind of seems like, uh. You know, like, like pulling she's into renting a bay it. at Pep Boys or yeah. pulling into a bay at exactly. Discount Tire. <laughs> like she, like she's kind of renting it like a storefront. So ships come in, they pay her, she rents the space out, and then can do repairs or whatever, charge them for it. You know, kind of like a yeah, kind of like a take in service type thing, or just a day parking deal. But um, kind of glossed over this point, but. Shooting at the droids and telling her that he does not want a single droid working on his ship just further goes into that point that we we yes. made in earlier episodes that he does not like droids. He hates droids. Not any a droids. Yeah. IG eleven. Now you got these droids that he does not like droids. And at least now we know why. You know, it's um... well, but like, yeah, exactly. With the flashbacks to the droids that take over his planet, kill his parents. I mean, it's pretty. I mean, I think we can assume that's the reason he hates droids. So, yeah. Indeed. He does not like droids. Yep. So, um, so she gets upset, and then he he tells her he'll pay her or whatever. He heads out. Um, you know, he Important locks baby note. Gizmo in like a little yes, a little cubby compartment, so he doesn't have to deal that's with his nonsense. Say. Baby get, or Green Gizmo, little Green Gizmo is asleep, and he puts him. I was talking. I told this to my wife when we were watching it. I said, "Can you imagine how great it would be if, when our kids fell asleep, we could just shove them into a closet <laughs> and close the door and leave the house?" I can imagine, especially with triplets, <laughs> that would be a lifesaver. Yeah, exactly. So he puts little Green Gizmo in a closet, and then he mm-hmm. leaves the ship and goes out into town. So. As he heads out, he sees the Stormtrooper helmets on stick. It was really cool artwork kind of in the rolling credits of that scene. Um, side note. Side note. I'm sorry. I, I keep doing this to you. And it's, it's, it's a theme across the Shattered Order, all our podcasts. So I like to interrupt you. But the end credits on these shows are incredible. And I love the way they do them because they 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 just keep showing the concept art for every episode as Very the credits cool. and they have some really really cool i wish that we could find uh, i mean maybe they already do this but i wish i could find it on the internet where they just post all of this concept art for me to download yeah i'd love to have these things as the background on that my would computer. be super they awesome. are so cool it's really good so um barber you may proceed all right so <laughs> uh, he he takes off. He's going somewhere to do something. Probably try to find work, uh, which we find out that is what he's doing. But so gotta she's, pay for the bay. So Pelly's 
actually playing cards with her droids rather than working on the damn ship. Earn your money, lady, but whatever. Uh, but she hears some cooing. So she gets up. And kind of starts heading towards the ship. Tells the droid to get her blaster. And she gets her blaster. And she sees Lil Green Gizmo coming out. Which. The fact that he was locked up. Uh, this is another instance. In which we know he's used the force. Because I don't think there's any way he would have been able to yeah, open that Yeah, how did place. you open that door? Like, he force opened the door. He force got down from the deal. Like. He is a force used in Little Fool, and um, isn't it funny to see a youngling with the force just using it to his will? Yeah, and, and it's one of those things like he hasn't been trained in the force; like it's just it's natural to him. And yeah. I, I, this is something I'm not sure about as far as if it's this natural to most. I mean, he, he's 50 years old, mm-hmm. granted, so. At some point, I guess he probably figures it out for a little while. Yeah. So uh, that's kind of interesting, though, that, you know, um, such a young creature mentally, you know, is is that akin to using the force. You know, it's kind of a repetitive thing with that one. Yep. I agree. Interesting, though. So she he walks out onto this thing and she's like. First off, she gets her droids to go grab a blaster, brings it to her. She's pointing it at it like, you better be careful. You come out here. And then she's like, within a second. A yeah. <laughs> within a second, she puts the thing away. And it's like, it's like a mom that always wanted a baby, but never had one. That's a it's, good point. I hadn't thought about that. Cause, I mean, she is super, she is super she motherly is enamored. with this thing. Yes. It's enamored with little green gizmo. So she's That is a really good like, point. So she's all over him, and her other and she's very her other thoughts are, hey, I can get some extra money out of this because hey, babysitting is expensive. I should know. I pay for it. I hate it. She's she's like, okay, I'm gonna fix a ship, but I'm gonna pay. He's gonna have to pay for babysitting now. This is so. something we'll kind of get back to later, but you know, he runs off and leaves little baby Gizmo with her and. I think that's another thing that, you know, whenever he shot at the droids in the beginning, you know, she's very protective. She's protective of her droids. And I think that's probably kind of the first sign that the Mandalorian Mm -hmm. realizes he could probably trust her with a little green gizmo is because of how protective she is. She knows how to use a gun. You know, she's kind of feisty. Like, it's it's not someone that... This was a a plot point I had an issue with initially. Um, but we'll kind of get back back to that. But um, so Mandalorian goes to the cantina. He's looking for bounty work. He says, and uh, he he's informed by the uh, bartender that we are familiar with that uh, the guild no longer works on Tatooine. Um, but as he's talking to him, a guy in the corner. It looks like it's the same seat that we initially see Han Solo in. Yeah, same like almost the same looking. Uh... I feel little, like it's uh, a different spot. I feel like Han Solo was on the other side of the door, if I recall correctly. But yeah. he, it's very Han Solo. It's the same type feeling. of booth, and yeah. he's sitting there with his feet propped up. You know, so it's the I same sort of entrance. He was uh, Toro Calican is his name, and he's got a bounty puck for Fennec Sean, who is a, as we find out, an elite mercenary. Can I? Can I? point out something that bugged me about sure this part of the episode okay so he just left the planet with cara dune yes and i understand that uh gosh i wish i knew i only know her as may from agents of shield but the actress for uh fennec the actress plays fennec as well as may and agents of shield looks very similar to the actress that plays cara dune of course she's asian and Cara Dune isn't, but you can't see that in the puck. So when they yeah, pop really this that. puck, yeah, well, let me just make the point and you might see what I'm saying. When the puck gets put down and the image po- popped up, the first thing I said, but thought of before they said uh, the name of the person yeah. was okay. that it was, a, I agree. it was a bounty for Cara Dune. That's I'm what like, it's kind of, I thought odd. the exact same thing. 
Yeah. It's kind of odd to have a character so similar looking in the puck yeah. hollow projector to Cara Dune. That is interesting. the first one you see when he leaves her. I mean, I understand it now that we've gone through the episode, but when I first saw it, I'm like, oh, he's hunting Cara Dune, and he's going to ask Mando to help him hunt her. Yep. And then he said the name, and I'm like, okay, so it's not the same per- person, but it's weird that they looked so similar. That kind of bugged me at first. Yep. So uh, I totally agree. I kind of, I thought the exact same thing. But so they, uh, they kind of start chatting. They kind of... Uh, come to an agreement where mando gets the money because that is this is this guy's first job and he He didn't want to admit that at first either that's true he was trying to act like he was an actual bounty hunter which mando's like i know better than that you took a very stupid bounty well you're gonna get not only that but as we learn the mandalorian people are on high alert for this guy Somebody in mm-hmm. the guild would know to look for him. And the fact that this guy wasn't alarmed by that, I think... Or oh, yeah, even aware of the situation, yeah. Yeah, I think the Mando can't, there knew can't be... that there was something up as far as him not not being completely upfront about his um, guild membership. Yeah, there can't be a lot of bounty hunters running around in full Beskar armor. Yeah, probably very few. <laughs> very, very so, few. Um, a person in the know would know what's going on. So one thing I liked is that he mentions that Fennec is out beyond the Dune Sea, uh, you know, which is, of course, <laughs> nice. a reference uh, to A New Hope, which I thought was really cool. But they talk about, you know, their agreement. And this is the first job, needs it to get in the guild, yada, yada, yada. And Mando wants the fob, the tracking fob. And Toro smashes it against the wall and says uh, that he, quote, has it all memorized. The hell does he have memorized? It's a tracking fob. Because it's not going to change in the next 24 to 36 hours. Exactly. Like, this is one thing that I did not think made a whole hell a lot of sense. Unless he knows that she's camping out there. Um. I Which think the funniest it looks part like was Mando's reaction, right? I don't know, you could you could tell what he was thinking through the helmet, and I expected a different response, yeah, a different response than he gave. But I thought it was hilarious because you you saw him tilt his head and just kind of look at him like, "Why the hell would you do that?" Yep. And so I was expecting a completely different response when he said, "Well, I guess you need me now. I have it all memorized," and Mando's just like thirty minutes. Yeah, I was like, oh, okay. I expected him to get mad and angry, but that didn't happen. I, I guess he just needed the money that bad. Yeah, uh, th- that whole thing's just kind of weird. Uh, we still don't know how the tracking fobs work. Is it like a laser GPS type deal that goes on somebody? Is it is it something that they put in the person somehow? Like it's almost seemingly like they have to know what planet they're on, and then from there they can like triangulate where they're at i don't know i I, yeah i don't because mando was gonna leave little green gizmo on that planet last week but once they knew that a bounty hunter was there and knew what planet he was on it was kiboshed they're like we got to get out of here well but how did they here's the question how did a bounty hunter get on that planet i have no that that's that's why i think the tracking fobs work cross plan i mean there's something to it's some sort of um, distance away type thing as you get no. more, think of it like hotter, colder, Marco Polo type thing, you know, closer you get, the louder it gets and you kind of follow, you know, that path if to get to like whatever it is. Based on DNA markers, I guess you can't change your DNA so you'll always be able to be found. But like, yeah, if it was in his skin, something that they tracked, they could just dig it out. Which would be kind of sad to have to dig something out of a or little green gizmo, but I, I, I still don't understand this thing. So I, I don't still, either. That is still a mystery to me. I that's don't... the one of the biggest mysteries of this show because the tracking fobs just they don't make a lot of sense given the mm-hmm. information that they have given us so far. Yep, I agree. 
So uh, we, uh, we'll we just assume, for the sake of not creating another plot hole, is that <laughs> she that Fennec has been up in one place. She's staying there. And that is kind of what it seems what we see later in the show. So maybe that's how they try to cover this. But um, we assume that's what he's talking about with having it memorized, the directions, and how to get there and all that sort of stuff. So Mendo heads back to his ship and finds no baby green gizmo. And then he re, uh, finds uh, Pelly, who ends up having him, and she kind of freaks out about leaving the kid with him, and she's going to have to charge him extra for babysitting, blah, blah, blah. Um, and then this part just... I thought this part was so stupid. This is the most, most look-for creature in the galaxy. Every bounty hunter has a fob on it. It doesn't have a puck because it's such a special thing. Like, and everybody has a tracker. Everybody knows about it. It's something everybody's looking for. And yet he goes to somebody who is trying to get in the guild and lets Baby Green Gizmo <laughs> be right in front of them when they're getting on the speeders. He literally How looked up it. Looked at. It. He looked at him, and he was kind of like, "Ew." But the, here's the thing that I thought when I watched him look at little green gizmo he looked at it and then looked at her and it was almost as if he just thought that that was her kid and it was weird this little weird creature that she was so in love with yeah like almost that it 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 didn't belong to mando it was this lady's so he didn't even think about the fact that it might be what you're talking about it seemed like that little glance that seemed like it was he thought it was that kid that lady's kid I yeah I guess maybe the the conversation from what I recall kind of made me think that this is really stupid but I mean that I might have to go back and watch it with that in mind and see if my opinion changes I think this is a point where my wife who's not a huge Star Wars fan asked a very interesting question okay so he looked at her Saw the Yoda and looked back at the Mando, and my wife goes, "Does no one in the galaxy know who Yoda is?" And I'm like, "I don't know. Like maybe people know the name, but don't know what he looks like. Like Yoda is a iconic Jedi figure, but we are getting to the point where we're later on, where people." Yoda was yet Yoda. Yippee, I'm what mixing my words here. Jedi, Jedi Yoda has been hiding for so long that maybe it's gotten to the point where people just know the name and not who he was or what he looked like. So maybe that's the reason. But my my wife was just so confused that someone could look at this thing and not think Yoda. Yeah, but do, I mean, do they really spread? Like, do they really share out what? everyone in the Jedi Council looked like? I mean... Well, not to mention, you know, I know names of people from foreign countries. And that's on this planet. I know names. I have no idea what they look like. Now let's go galaxy-wide. If yeah. you've heard of important name from another planet, you know, light years away, you're not going to know what they look like, probably. Yeah. Right? So that was my thought when she asked that question. But it is interesting that and as far as we know, there's only three of them. So that also adds to the... Mis- you're, you're looking at something... A that male, a female, tons- and a baby. Interesting. Yeah. you're Interesting. <laughs> Let's, we won't go into that, but... Interesting. It's, it's interesting that we're talking about our planet, and you, you could not know people here, obviously. So to go galaxy-wide, and if there's three of them that we know of... For someone on a remote planet to not know what this thing is or what it looks like, it makes sense to me. Yeah, no, that's totally fair. But I just feel like, hey, we're looking for a green kid. I mean, you don't need much of a description for somebody relatively close to the Bioners Guild to be looking <laughs> for the thing. You know, yeah, that's very, very true. big ears, very green true. kid. Simple. Um, I, I don't know. That part just didn't really work for me. I, I feel mm-hmm. like some of the writing as far as that goes is just a little bit sloppy and it's kind of like, you know, just just deal with it and we'll keep going. But um, <laughs> anyway, so 
they jump on their speeder bikes and they end up heading out. And they I, meaning Toro Calocan, the uh, the bounty quote unquote bounty hunter that hired Mando hunter. to work with them. Yes. Yeah. They head on and their speeder bikes. Mando. They head out. And they have an and epic race. Toro's got to be first. They were going back and forth. And they get to a point where Mando stops them for a specific reason. And I um, loved this scene. The, it was really Crack funny. Me up. So Cal gets out, uh, Cal, 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 Toro Calican. He gets out his binox and starts looking around. He sees the Tuscans and he's talking about how. You know, he's trying to act they're so like, tough and everything about football fields away. The ones he's looking through through his body. Exactly. And then uh, and then Mando's like, well, why don't you tell him yourself? And then you turn and there are two Tuscans there. And <laughs> it's right there. so funny. That so is great. It's great. And, um, you know, Interesting, then, though, that they did not attack first, because it seems like from the original trilogy, they would have just gone on the offensive. The Tuscan Raiders. It was interesting that they... Well, they also ran into a Mandalorian. Yeah, no, that's true. They didn't run into some kid with a couple droids that didn't have a weapon. You know, yeah. it's... Driving on his speeder with two droids. Well, I guess he did have a weapon. He had his rifle, I think. But, yeah, it's... Uh, I mean, it's it's much different, you know, dealing with two bounty hunters than it is some kid with a couple droids. Um but that that is a really good point, I, you know. It's, uh, but yeah, because th- this is the first time that we've seen Tuscans kind of be communicate with anyone but themselves. Exactly. It, and, this this added a layer of humanity to the Tuscans that I didn't. Yes. Know yes. Very and much I, and so. If you listen to this podcast, including the Shadowrunner podcast about Swaga, and I think I may have mentioned it on this one, maybe not, but. I love the Tuscans. There's some uh, s- yes. Star Wars yes, car- collectible card game. I played Tuscans. I love them. I just love that faction to ter- humanize them a little bit to make them more smarter than just the aborigines that attack everything without talking. It was really cool to be see them like talking in sign language to Mando who apparently knew Tuscan sign language. I don't know, but it was hilarious. Yep. It was hilarious what Mando said to Toro after he talked to the Tuscans and bought them passage through the Tuscans' land safely. Because he ended up, Mando ended up having to give the Tuscans Toro's pair of electro binoculars, yep. to which Toro replied, Those were brand new. And he said, <laughs> And Mando's reply, They were. Mm. Yep. <laughs> and then they go. <laughs> Crack me up. Yep. Very good that whole sequence. So that that those binocs actually give them safe passage through the Tuscan area. So uh, they're heading out and they get to a ridge with like a little valley. They stop and kind of look out there and they see that there is like a bantha with a rider that's been dismounted. So correction, ma- it was a dewback. Oh, a dewback. Okay. Yes. I was okay. The banthas were what they looked through in the binox to see that the uh, Tuscans were there. So when they got uh, past right. through the Tuscan section, they saw the dewback, which is the the kind of like animal that was added in the uh, special edition of the star wars original trilogy back when people were like why are they making a special edition and adding all this crap well there were dewbacks on tatooine and they added another dewback which was kind of walking through this valley dragging someone behind them now toro and mandalorian did not know who it was so they kind of like stayed back on the hill of this valley toro stayed there and Mando said, I'm going to go check it out. So he goes running down into this hill. He walks down to the stew back. And, and then there's a person in armor on their stomach in Mandalorian. Clearly kinda. a bounty hunter. Yeah. So he flips him over and clearly can see he's a bounty hunter. He's been shot in the chest by something. But he can see the tracking fob on this guy. So he picks up this tracking fob. Because obviously this, this bounty hunter was also looking for Finnick. And so he picks it up and he's looking at it and he's realizing which way it's pointing. 
The second he looks up, he gets slammed in like the uh, shoulder by a sniper shot. So you know, uh, I keep think I keep thinking I'm saying this name. Is it Finnick? Yeah, Finnick shoots yes. him from a ridge on mountains, really, really far away. So the shot hits him in the, the in the Beskar, doesn't hurt him. And he basically tells Toro to get down, turns around and runs. He's starting to run up this hill, trying to get over the ledge before he gets shot again. Well, he gets to almost to the top of the ledge before he can jump over and hide and get shot in the back now a second time. But he's not hurt. The next, what he says is really important. And I'm not sure it lines up with what happens in the rest of the episode. He says the best car holds up at this range. He, he ends up getting shot again much, much closer, and yet it's it still held up. Hold, it held up. So no. either the rifle's not as powerful as he thought, or maybe, I, I don't know. I thought that was kind of interesting because they kind of hinted towards, you know, this best guard isn't going to hold up that type of rifle if they get closer, but yet it did end up doing so. Kind of, I don't, I don't know, didn't exactly add up. Or Mando just doesn't know his stuff as much as he thought he did. Anyway, so they uh, ultimately decide that they will ride towards where Fennec is at dark, uh, where they kind of have the advantage, where she kind of she's forced to use the scope on her rifle to look, you know, use the uh, what's it and called? Using heat finder, thermal detector, thermal um, detector. But then on top of that, they have this awesome plan of alternating shooting these flares. Yes, to blow up her, her. Uh, Thermal exactly. detector. Basically, bl- so- the the first like flashbang ca- actually blinds her because she wasn't expecting it at mm-hmm. all. The following well, ones, she was expecting it a little bit more and was able to kind of plan for it. Took a shot, missed. But here's where the stupid part ends. Uh, Toro on his the third shot shoots it into the ground. And it doesn't even go off, which ends up making it so that she can hone in on Mando. Takes a shot, and like to you, much to what you said earlier, takes a shot, hits him right in the chest. His biker bike blows up. He shoots flying off of this thing, and he's down. So now it's well, up to Toro to get there to these mountains. Right. Well, she Mando's first down. hits his bike. She hits the bike first, dismounts him yeah, from yeah, the bike. Yeah, you're right. Hits the and bike, then she him. actually shoots him in the Beskar. In the chest. Right in the chest. R- like, very painful, shot. I'm sure. Yeah. Well, like, I'm sure it's like getting shot with a uh, Kevlar. bulletproof vest. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, so, anyway, she shoots him, but she's focused on him because she can see him. Yes. But he's, sh- he's. Mando continues shooting his flare. Toro continues shooting his flare until he gets to there. So, Mando's kind of out in the open. That's when he takes the shot to the chest and goes down. But Toro ends up getting there. So he's like, oh, okay, Toro's there. The the other, the second bounty hunter's there. Well, that's when he starts getting completely manhandled by Finnick. Finnick they is kicking a, his ass. It's a pretty good fight destroying. scene. But, uh, yeah, it was, uh, yeah, she owned him. Mando's, Mando's next words were perfect. Thanks for the distraction, kid. Yes. <laughs> He's got the gun right on her, dead to rights. They're, yep, that's very they, good. They, ca- they catch Fennec. That's the end for Fennec. Yep, indeed. So they basically throw the cuffs to her, make her cuff herself, and the the next part is just so stupid. I, I can't get over... I, I just feel like a lot of the writing in this episode was just lazily done because... This whole exchange, this very relatively short exchange with Toro and Mando, where, you know, Mando tells him to go get the do back, and he's like, no, you do it. I'm like, why, why does Mando agree? They have a freaking speeder. Take the speeder to the do back, ride the do back back, yeah. everybody get on there and take it, take it. Back to Moss Eisley. It's, I mean, I don't understand why somebody has to go walk out. alone. I mean, yeah. I, I would feel like if I'm Mando at that point, I feel like he's trying to do something if he's keeping the speeder. I mean, why can't yeah. you go get the do-back, 
because clearly the do the do back is kind of on their way to where she's at. They came in from the opposite side, so he could have rode the speeder to the do back, went back, everybody got on it, went back to the speeder, and then taken the speeder if they saw it. Take the speeder. This whole thing was just so stupid. I I did I did not buy this for one second. It was just. It was a stupid way to split them up and leave Toro and Finnick alone. I feel like they could have done something much better. It just seemed lazy. Something that made more sense than that. Yeah, it was just not good. Um, but anyway, this is what we got. So Mando heads off and Finnick and Toro get to chatting. And of course, Finnick is a mercenary. She's aware of the stuff going on. She's much more up to date with everything than Toro is, clearly. And I thought it was really interesting that we found out the name of the planet that we didn't know the name of before. Oh. And that is that the first planet they were on with the Bounty Hunter Guild was named Navarro. Because we didn't yes. know that until now. That is a great point. Yes. So I was like, okay, interesting. Now we now know the name of the planet. Yep. That we didn't know before. 100%. Yeah, so uh, they they mentioned that, and, uh, you know, Finnick is obviously familiar with the Mandalorian situation, and she basically talks Toro into betraying Mando in an attempt to save her life from getting, you know, taken in, trying to get him to help her because... Her, she's gambling on the fact that Toro realizes he would need Fennec's help to take down Mando, who is a more prized target than Fennec. Mm -hmm. However, that's a bit of a miscalculation because Toro just kills her and then runs. Um, Did he kill her, though? He shot... I mean, he shot her in the stomach. I assume so. Shot her straight in the stomach. Well, I guess we can get to that in a second. That seems like a pretty safe, safe kill. But yeah, we'll we'll get to that towards at the end. Um, but she also tells him that he has a kid with her, and that's when he remembers little green gizmo. Probably was not Pelly's, but it was probably actually with Mando. So he, of course, jumps on the speeder that Mando let him have, and here's this this is something else that just seems like such obvious but piss poor writing they're within sniper distance of Fennec at the Bantha or sorry the Dubak mm -hmm. wouldn't he hear the bloody speeder going wouldn't he Don't I mean leaving. at that distance wouldn't he hear the blaster wouldn't he hear the speeder this I mean it's not that far away I mean, how far can you hear a gunshot? You can hear a gunshot from pretty long ass ways away. It just, I don't, the, I, all of this is just, I don't know. Didn't really do it for me. A lot of interesting and weird parts to this episode that you're just like, I'm having to suspend my disbelief a lot more than normal here. Yes. And I get this is Star Wars, but... Th this stuff seems pretty basic. Yeah. I mean, I, I feel like the rules of sound and that sort of stuff, we should expect to be pretty similar no matter where they go. And just, yeah, I just I just couldn't get on board. It's, like I said earlier, it just seemed like a lazy way to get through the scene because this was important for some reason. Um, we'll talk about that the entire episode here shortly we'll finish kind of getting through everything that happens but um uh so mando ends up taking the do back back to moss eisley after he finds finnick which i assume is also how we know finnick's dead because he found her i would assume that he checked her and all that sort of stuff um to make did sure she was dead important point he did not check on her just okay. saw her and kind of turned around and left. So, who knows on, on Finnick? I guess I, I would. I would have assumed that he would have actually checked her. Pulse, I'm, I'm looking at these notes and I'm curious if, if he, he saw the very end of the episode. <clears throat> yes. Okay. I did. 
Yes. Or, um, so, and, and uh, like I said, we'll, we'll get to that in a second. But anyway, so, uh, Mando rides the Dubak all the way back to Moss Eisley. And Finnick, or sorry, not Finnick, Toro has basically kidnapped Little Green Gizmo. And he's basically waiting at the Bounty Hunter ship because the Bounty Hunter Mandalorian stupidly told him what bay he was at. That was, that was another thing. Why? Why, why would you tell another wannabe bounty hunter trying to get in the guild where your freaking ship is? You're a bloody Mandalorian with obvious armor. You know people are looking for you. I know it's Moss Eisley, but come on. Um, yeah, that was odd. Maybe like, he, meet me here in 30 minutes and for no specific reason except, you know, obviously my ship's there. It, if the I'm, thing meant to suspend disbelief here was the droid saying that the guild doesn't operate here, that doesn't do it. Because just because it doesn't operate there doesn't mean there's not bounty hunters there. Doesn't mean there's not people there looking for them as we come to find out. Basically, they don't give out bounties there. Exactly. They're not there. It's, I just, oh, I'm, uh, more stuff that I just kind of hated in this episode. Um, but anyway, so Finnick, uh, not Finnick. God, I, I keep screwing that. Toro is, Standing there with Little Green Gizmo held hostage. And Pelly held hostage. And, of course, he makes he makes him surrender and put his hands up. But what he doesn't catch is the fact that the Mandalorian grabs a flashbang. And has it in his hand as, uh, you know, Toro tells Pelly to go up and cuff him. And so... What did Pelly say to him? You're smarter um, than you look? Yes. Or something like that? Yes. Because she realizes what's about to happen, what, he's what gonna he has do. in his hand. So he throws yeah. the flashbang and is able to run to the side of the ship. And when Toro comes back, he's, you know, once he's able to see, you know, Mando basically has an open shot at him and blasts him. In which he falls off the edge. And Here's, a, here's what got me with that part. Okay. He's holding baby little green gizmo. Yeah, you just shot him, and he's going yeah. off the ramp, and you don't know what's going to happen to the little green gizmo. Yeah, you do. He's going to use the force. That's what he Let's does. Let's hope that's what happened. But I, I was just like, man, what if he fell on top of him? Like that's, I guess that's a risk you take. But well, yeah, shot- I mean, it's if he gets a little smashed, that's much better than him getting <laughs> taken. A, by- when you're like life or death situation, you got to do exactly. what you got to do. But yeah. he shot this dude with him holding. Little green gizmo. They fall off the ramp to his the razor crest, and suddenly they all run it. Both Pelly and Mando run over there, and they're like, suddenly, little green gizmo's disappeared. What happened to him? He comes popping out of these little car, these little uh, cargo <coughs> carts, and he's like, "Hey guys, I'm over here." I mean, he so got over there fast too. I mean, yeah, that's very. This true. is because definitely did, another force used there so since. Quick. Yeah, I mean, the, uh, this makes that first scene in episode two where he uses the force so much more important. Where he stops that mud horn. Mm-hmm. I mean, because that that is at least a viable way to explain away this stuff. Unlike self, a lot of the stuff in this episode. Self-preservation is higher than anything else in the world. Exactly. Like, <laughs> if he has the ability to use the Force, he will do it when he has to. And that's what he does. It's, no. you know. So, um, I didn't particularly have an issue with that. But he ends up check, checking Toro out. And he finds some dollar bills. Um, coins, whatever. And <laughs> ends up paying Pelly with them. And... um. Which leads to an interesting thought about the end of the episode. Which leads us to the end of the episode indeed. So let, let me let me set the scene here and you can tell me what you think. All okay. Right. So Mando now has no money because he just paid Pelly for fixing his ship. Okay. Ship Razor Crest is good. You know, so you now you've got Mando and uh Mando and Little Green Gizmo. They're off in this separate 
place that you don't know where they're at or what's going on. There is still a bounty on Finnick, right? Yes. So Mando knows where Finnick is. So it cuts to the scene where you're back out in the Tusken Raiders area in the desert, and you hear these like spur type sounds as someone's walking. And this figure walks up to Finnick laying on the ground. And it stops with the legs of that person with a cape standing there over Finnick on the ground. And that's where the episode ends. I got a couple thoughts. One, I don't think Finnick's dead. Okay. That's what? fair. I to think we're going to see more of Finnick. <clears throat> By the way, I okay. thought it was interesting we didn't mention earlier. Finnick, uh, they talked about Finnick being a. Uh, a death dealer or you know sniper contract killer for all the bad people in the area including yep. the huts so they mentioned the huts on yeah. tatooine mm-hmm. makes total sense but anyways i don't think Hut, i don't think Phoenix dead and then you got to figure out who this character is is it mandalorian going back to get the bounty on her because he has no money no and well, that's I, I would say no I, was there as well because yeah. who would he turn the bounty in to get the money? It also didn't look like him. I think, and this is just my opinion. I okay. think that is the introduction of Gian, Giancarlo Espinosa's Espinosa Espinota Giancarlo last name I can't remember at the moment. The guy from um, Breaking Bad. I think this is an introduction of his character. Okay. That's what I think we're getting into in the next episode. So, uh, so I, I have to say, so far in this show in general, I'm disappointed at the hype for Gina Carano and the fact that she's only been in one episode. It's kind of disappointing. And that might be something that they're doing is kind of like these higher profile people. They kind of get their own episode which, if so, is a little bit disappointing, but I, I guess I can deal with. But so, Bart, this I don't... is episode five. Yes. There are nine episodes. We have four episodes to get Giancarlo Esposito's character. Uh, I have a feeling we're going to see more of Cara Dune. And if, I agree. I think that those three are the only three that I really think are going to be big in this series and i don't think we're gonna see the client until maybe episodes eight and nine i think we're gonna see that guy again okay you know what i'm talking about right uh which guy the guy that hired mandalorian to get little oh grief not grief the empire guy oh got the client okay yeah. Oh, I don't think we'll see him till oh, eight, episode yeah, eight and nine, yes. and I think that he's going to okay. play a big part in the show, but not until we see him again later. Giancarlo is going to have some part with that guy, because obviously Giancarlo's character is Empire, and so is the client. Um, I think Cara Dune and him are going to get back together to fight in the maybe the last three episodes. Um, I hope so, but I think I, there's a lot going on yeah. here. I really I th- hope that's what they're leading to. I hope that we lead to like hour long eight and nine episodes. I, I think there were only eight episodes in this season. Are there eight? I think there's nine. I think there's eight. I am I I am checking I just checked Wikipedia and it says that there is eight. That's what I've been thinking, and that confirms what I was thinking. All right. Well, they got three episodes to get all that done. So I have a feeling in the next episode, we get to meet Giancarlo Esposito's character. I think eventually, if we don't meet Cara Dune again in the next episode, I bet we do in the eighth or seventh. Because I just feel like that Cara Dune and Giancarlo's character and the client are the la- the next most impar- important characters besides mando and maybe grief somehow as the twist at the end of episode eight okay that's what i'm thinking right now i will say Mm. this what do you think what do you think what do you give the rating for this episode personally i think it is the maybe least that's exactly what i give it 
I think this was the least exciting episode. I, that doesn't mean I don't think it was good, but I don't think it really added anything. I enjoyed what did we it. What learn? The, the plot. What did holes we learn about were, the characters in this episode? We we learned the Mandalorian makes stupid decisions, and and is that what we were supposed to learn? Because that's what we learned. But I mean, like, what was this episode for? You know what I mean? I, I mean, I don't. I I really don't know. It, the only thing that I can see this episode being used for is to introduce the character that finds, um, that ended up finding Fennec Shand at the end. That's pretty much it. I mean, I, I don't really see any anything else, maybe. I mean, may, maybe as a reason to get him on Tatooine. He needs to be on Tatooine. Maybe the rest of this season will take place on Tatooine. Um, I, I mean, I could see that as a possibility. And we might look back on this and think that this episode makes more sense. But as of now, um, I mean... It doesn't. And the last episode was kind of the same way. It just kind of seems like... Well, there's we learned this more big about the Mando story. culture in the last episode. We learned, there was a lot that's, going on in the last okay, episode. That's That true. is more important than this episode. In 100%. This episode, didn't have anything I can, that important. The Agreed. only thing I can think of is that we we learned that there's a big there's a big warrant out for the Mandalorian. We also I, learned that the guild is not on this planet. That might be kind of that, big. That because... might be a key that I did not think about. But as far as my other point, where we learned that he's everybody's going after him, I don't think we needed an entire thirty minute episode to realize that everybody wants this guy. I yeah. think we realized with the last episode what it meant to betray the Bounty Hunter Guild. I don't think we needed, you know, Finnick telling an, uh, an inspiring Bounty Hunter what it meant to yep. catch him and turn him into the Bounty Hunter Guild, all that stuff. I don't think we needed to know all that. I think that that was pretty much assumed. And if we did not have this episode, I would have assumed that anyways. Because in most things, any show where you break a code or you break the rules of someone that you are working for especially in a show like this it's a big deal i didn't need an entire episode to tell me that so i want to yeah. know going forward and we'll probably learn this later on like you said maybe the bounty hunter thing on tatooine or the fact that he's being chased so hard or that everyone that knows what happened on navarro the new planet we learn should know who he is and what it would mean to turn him in if that's all we learn, I hope that in the next couple episodes we learn why this episode was important to the grand scheme of things. I hope so, because as of right now, it's just it's not doing much for me. Um, it was very underwhelming. We didn't learn enough. It didn't make sense. The story path to how we got to where we got. It just there's too many just stupid decisions and plot holes that I wasn't particularly a fan of. And I was wrong because I mentioned saying we learned about the Mando culture in the last episode, but I was thinking of the episode before that where he was saved off of Navarro by the Mandalorians. Last episode was the one where he was on the planet with Jim and he was Bronner's going to leave. And... Yes, that's, yes. I, I, and, I totally mixed well, that up. So, But we did learn a lot about Mandalorian culture in that. I mean, that that was correct. I mean, there was... We also learned that he was willing, almost almost to the point where he let someone take his helmet off. You exactly. Know, there was a lot of things that went on in the last episode that I feel were much more important to his story than this episode. So yeah. we'll see what happens next week. I don't, I'm with you. Totally a 5 out of 10. I didn't think it was a that terrible does... episode, but I didn't think it, I don't, I, at this point, I don't know where it fits. I enjoyed it, but j just... Like you said, the not understanding of how this fits and where it's going is just kind of disappointing in a way. And I really hope that it kind of gets a little bit more back on the the path that we expected of a little bit more of a, I don't necessarily want to say linear story, but a story that kind of makes sense based, you know, where characters are making decisions that, you know, maybe make a little bit more sense more sense to what we know about them um and because yep. i just feel like a lot of stuff in this episode did not live up to that but um 
you know, the, the, there was some good stuff, but overall just, eh. I mean, I enjoyed watching it, but Stand it was alone. one of those, as soon as it was over, I was just kind of like, eh. It's one of those, so. Low rewatchability. Of, yeah, low rewatchability. It, we're getting a lot. I'm starting to get the feeling in this show very similar to when I watch like Law and Order. SVU. Like Law and Order SVU has an episode. You could get into the episode and enjoy the episode. And then it has a very of a little bit of an overarching story. So far in this show, all the episodes have a good story if you watched it standalone that really added to the overarching story. This is one of those episodes where it was a standalone episode which didn't add didn't seemingly add a lot to the overarching story. It's one of those you could watch it and enjoy it. It's a good show. It's very enjoyable yeah. with what happens, but it doesn't add much to the overarc. So, I'm hoping that we figure out how this fits in later, uh where all of the what we learn fits in the universe, but right now not the best episode yet. So I I agree one hundred percent. But oh well, um, well, I said this. I'm still every. You know what? I ask my wife this every week, and she still doesn't know the answer. Every Friday, I go. You know what day it is? And she goes. She'll say Friday, or she'll be like grocery day, or something like that. And I always tell her, no, it's Mandalorian day. And then she rolls her eyes at me. Yeah, that's that's expected. That's, that's what wives do. <laughs> I it's still Monday. look forward to Mandalorian Day every I, week. So I, I can't too. wait to talk about this next week and see what what happens and how it how it explains things that happen this week. It'll be super fun. Yep. I love. I, I can't. Oh man, the I, the I show enjoy the been show renewed for it's, season two. I'm freaking stoked. I love yep. this show. I really hope that these last three episodes finish a little bit stronger than this one did because um, I really hope if this episode was the bottom of the barrel, I'll be pretty happy. But if there's a worse episode than this, I, I mean, I would be surprised if I'm being honest. I would be too. I, if I you agree. have very little left to go through to get to the end. I feel like the next three or four, because I still feel like I've heard there's nine episodes, no matter what things say. If these last three or four, I feel like these last three, four got to be action packed all the way through to finish out the season. There's got to be a lot of questions that are answered. There's information about Lil Green Gizmo that we don't know. There's still stuff about the Mandalorian and his culture. The flashbacks have been really important. Where he came from has been important. There's been so much of that. A lot of that needs to be answered. We need to get a lot of those answers this season. Otherwise, I mean, people are going to feel, you know, a little a little duped about coming back for season two, I think. So yeah. um, I, I really hope they get to that stuff sooner rather than later so that we can talk about it. No doubt. Well, we will indeed talk about it next week on Chosen Ones. So I want to pre- I want to say this. I don't think we've put out our appreciation to everyone that's listened to this podcast since we started it. Thank you for listening to Chosen Ones. We really appreciate that. I really I don't know. I I really want to get into Rebels this week. We'll see if that happens. I know you were trying to get into Clone Wars last week, but we're looking to put out more episodes than just Clone Wars hyphen Mandalorian. We got Clone Wars stuff we coming up. We got Rebels stuff coming up. There's a movie coming up. There's a movie. We may have to talk about that. We should probably mention that there's a tie-in on Mandalorian coming for the new movie. Yeah. But there's a lot of good stuff on this show coming up, so keep tuned to the channel. If you like the show, if this is the first one you've listened to, Give us subscribe to the channel. Enjoy all the stuff we put out because there's a lot more to come because there's a lot more Star Wars to come. So uh, we appreciate you listening. Uh, We look forward to chapter six. And Wink, do you have anything else to say to the people? Um, I think about the only thing I can say at this point is we have spoken.